Hello, this is Angelia, and you are listening to or watching the podcast, Why You Do What You Do. Um, the podcast that talks about uh, human development and psychology to kind of try and help you figure out a little bit more of maybe why you do what you do. Um, and last time uh, we were talking about um, asthma um, and how that can be a problem, you know, for your kids. Um, and we're going to pick up on HIV and AIDS, um, regardless of your feelings on that. Uh, no offense, don't care how you feel about that. <laughs> it's a disease and it's around, you know. People get it. Children infected with the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, are at high risk to develop AIDS, which is the end stage of the disease. 90% of these children acquired the AIDS virus from their mothers. Almost all of them in the womb. Um, so, you know, these children didn't do anything to get AIDS. Um, they were born with it. Most children infected with HIV who reach school age function normally. Those with symptoms of AIDS may develop central nervous system dysfunction that can interfere with their ability to learn. But uh, antiretroviral therapy can improve their functioning. Um, and combination therapy, including protease inhibitors, has markedly reduced mortality among HIV-infected children and adolescents. Since there is virtually no risk of infecting classmates, again, uh, you got to get it through the blood. Um, and, you know, that's not something, or sexual transmission, um, that's not something that's usually happening in an uh, school environment. Um, children who carry the AIDS virus do not need to be isolated, either for their own uh, health or for that of other children. Because, like I said, you can't get it from touching, you know, you can't get it from touching stuff they've touched, you know. They should be encouraged to participate in all school activities, including athletics, to the extent that they are able um, and again, you know, uh, high contact sports, probably not the best choice for them. <coughs> Accidental injuries. Injuries increase between ages 5 and 14, and that's because the kids are becoming more mobile. Um, as children take part in more physical activities and are supervised less. Um, now, I'm going to touch on that. Um... Your child, until they are at least 10 or 100 pounds, should be supervised at all times outside. There are too many children who go missing. We had children get snatched in my neighborhood. My children didn't because I watched them um, until the oldest one was big enough where I felt like he could keep an eye on them. And we actually had two men come over our fence and the kids ran in and told me, hey mom, these men are coming uh, over our fence and so I came out there and I let my dogs out there um, and they quickly went back over the fence um, so do not leave your young children out alone you're just asking for it and it can have disastrous consequences so as an early childhood accidental injuries are the leading cause of death because people aren't watching the kids and they get hurt and die. In 1998, approximately 275 children died and about 430,000 went to emergency rooms for treatment of non-fatal injuries as a result of bicycle accidents. And um, my sister died from a bicycle accident. So um, my children had helmets and I feel like yeah, you know, I'm in a good place to say you should have your children wear helmets. You know, why risk it? Because one good knock on that noggin, you know, and the brain swells, you could lose your child. And an estimated 23,000 of these were serious brain injuries. As many as 88% of these injuries could be prevented by using helmets. Protective headgear also is vital for baseball and softball, football, roller skating, roller blading, skateboarding, scooter riding, horseback riding, hockey, speed sledding, and tobogganing. Um, and don't 
you're the parent. Don't let them tell you, I don't need a helmet. I don't want to wear a helmet. Blah, blah, blah. I look stupid. You know, what? who cares? If you want to do this, you're putting on the helmet. <laughs> For soccer, protective goggles and mouth guards may help reduce head and facial injuries. Now, you know, um, some people think no. Some people think it's okay. I kind of left it, you know, to my son. He was older. So, you know, that was his choice. Heading the ball should be minimized because of the danger of brain injury. Now, I never did like that. And I said, don't, don't do it like that. Don't do it like that. Because, you know, I have a little experience with the brain injuries and the, eh, not a fan of these things. Children under 14 suffered more than 1,260 snowmobile-related injuries. Many of them severe and some fatal. So, you know, use some common sense. If you're getting the kitty on the snowmobile, use some common sense. The AAP Committee on Accident and Poison Prevention recommends that children under 16 not use snowmobiles and that older riders be required by law to be licensed to wear helmets and be licensed and to wear helmets all the time you know just common sense there for a growing number of children an important source of danger is the trampoline in the backyard now my great aunt and uncle had a trampoline we kids loved it um but what my uncle did do was dig a hole and have the trampoline level with the ground um so that we fell off the trampoline we we're just falling on the ground so you know that was smart on his part mm -hmm. In 1996, an estimated um, 83,400 trampoline-related injured, inner, good my gosh, injuries, bleh, don't have a stroke, were treated in U.S. hospital emergency rooms. A 140% increase since 1990, and more than two-thirds of the victims were 5 to 14 years old. Um, so, you know, you might want to watch them. Uh, you might want to, uh, like I said, uh, fix that. There's these protective fences you can get around it, but they're not super great. Um, there's even, you know, uh, these things you can put in the spaces, you know, to protect the kids. You know, you've got to keep the kids safe. So whatever you can do, you know, above and beyond what the manufacturer does, to keep your kids safe, you know, in my opinion, that's worth it as a parent to know my kid is safe, you know. Many of these children required surgery or hospitalization. Because of the need for stringent safety precautions and constant supervision, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Injury and Poison Prevention and Committee on Sports Medicine and Fitness recommend that parents never buy trampolines nor should children use them on playgrounds or at school. Now, again, I don't think we need to go quite that far. And there are actual places you can go and jump on trampolines, these places. Um, and they have, like, the foam blocks and all that. And, and they have the blockages between the springs and covers and things like that. And that's a better idea, you know. Um, you can get a tarp. You can cover that uh, trampoline. Um, and, you know, fix it around the, the springs and things so that it's safe, so that your kid's not going through, their leg's not going through, arm's not going through, head's not going through. Um, you know, there are things you can do to make things more safe. Um, I'm against, you know, saying never do this, never do that, because if you do it safely, you know, it can be fun for your kids. They can learn, they can develop, you know, uh, core strength. Um, so I'm not a big believer in saying never on anything unless it's something that is so detrimental, you know, mentally, emotionally to the child, you know, then there are safe ways to do things, research the safe way, do things the safe way, have some common sense. We don't need everything regulated and monitored, you know, just do, do your own due diligence. So your child does not get hurt. <coughs> Unfortunately, the media do not encourage safety consciousness. No, they don't. Um, and history does not encourage safety consciousness. 
I know a lot of people I grew up with um, and even back in my own family where the children were turned out at, at sunup and allowed to play all day outside without checking in or the mom checking on them till sundown. And then, you know, they make memes about it and we survived. Well, guess what? There were a lot of those who did not survive. There were children who got killed. Um, there were children who died. There were children who went missing and were never seen again. So thank God that you did survive that. But there were a lot of children who did not survive that. So to make light of that, that, you know, parents are now too overprotective, um, that's just ignorant. Because there were children who did not come out okay from that type of raising. So if you did, thank God you were blessed enough to be safe. You know, God was watching out for you in an environment where nobody else was watching out for you. You know, um, I got to plug us in here because it's telling me we're getting low. So we're going to get plugged in. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna bother pausing and restarting for just sticking in a plug. You can you can hang with me that long, I think. <laughs> and if you can't, you got attention issues you might want to address. <laughs> uh, oh gosh. Um, in the 25 most popular G and PG rated non-animated movies between um, those years, most characters did not wear. Automobile safety belts, look both ways when crossing streets, use crosswalks, wear helmets when bicycling, or wear flotation devices while boating. Um, and of course, that's movies. That's not real life. And if you see that in the movie, um, like sometimes we'd say that, and I'd say, you see that? They're not wearing a seatbelt. That's not very safe, is it? If they had a wreck, that could just fly through the windshield right now. You can even point these things out. You know, it's your job to teach these children uh, safety consciousness. That's your job as a parent. It's not the media's job or blah, blah, blah. That's your job. Cognitive development. Pia Jayden approached the concrete operational child. At about age seven, according to Pia Jay, children enter the stage of concrete operations. So named because children can now use mental operations uh, to solve concrete actual problems. Children can think more logically than before because they can take multiple aspects of a situation into account. However, they are, are still limited to thinking about real situations in the here and now. <clears throat> they can't think about, well, what could this cause and what is, you know, blah, 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 what's going to happen down the road. They're still right here, <laughs> which in all honesty, that's a good place to be, um, except for, yeah, knowing, you know, what this could bring about or whatever. So, cognitive advances. Children in the stage of concrete operations can perform many tasks at a much higher level than they could in the pre-operational stage. They have a better understanding of spatial concepts, of causality, of categorization, of inductive and deductive reasoning, and of conservation. Um, and that's how they start to figure things out, you know. Uh, when old Sherlock Holmes was a little kid, <laughs> if he were a real dude, um, <laughs> you know, then that would have been a time where he would have started peeking uh, and figuring stuff out using deductive reasoning, you know, which would have been handy for him in later life because he was such a great detective. Um, space and causality. Children in the stage of concrete operations can better understand spatial relationships. They have a clear idea of how far it is from one place to another and how long it will take to get there. And they can more easily remember the route and the landmarks along the way. Um, and I remember we used to do that, uh, you know, going to Grandma's house. We, oh, we're almost there. There's that store or whatever. You know, so, you know, that's just something that you gain with age and experience. Experience plays a role in this development. A child who walks to school becomes more familiar with the neighborhood outside the home. 
Um, and yeah, you know, like we used to walk to the bus stop and, you know, we'd see other people's houses and, you know, uh, things of that nature. And, you know, to me, I kind of enjoyed like watching them put different decorations out for, you know, the season or whatever. <laughs> the abilities to use maps and models and to communicate spatial information improve with age. Although six-year-olds can search for and find hidden objects, they usually do not give clear directions for finding the same objects. So they found it, but they can't tell, you know, another kid how to find it as easily. Um, they're still working on that. Um, advances in, good gosh, this word is all jumbled. Selected cognitive abilities during middle childhood. Um, yeah, we have yellow writing on a red background. <laughs> Sometimes people, I don't even know about you. Abilities, spatial thinking. Um, Danielle can use a map or model to help her search, oh my gosh, for a hidden object and can give someone else directions for finding the object. She can find her way to and from school, can estimate distances, and can judge how long it will take her to go from one place to another. Cause and effect. Douglas knows which physical att attributes of objects on each side of a balance scale will affect the result. Meaning, you know, the number of objects. Um, my gosh, matters, but color does not. He does not yet know which spatial factors, such as position and placement of the objects, makes a difference. Classification. Elena can sort objects into categories, such as shape, color, or both. She knows that a subclass, roses, has fewer members than the class which it belongs to, flowers. Seriation and transitive inference. Catherine can arrange a group of sticks in order from the shortest to the longest and can insert an intermediate size stick into the proper place. She knows that if one stick is longer than a second stick, and the second stick is longer than a third, then the first stick is longer than the third. Inductive and deductive reasoning. Dura can solve both inductive and deductive problems, and knows that inductive conclusions, based on particular premises, are less certain than deductive ones based on general premises. Conservation. Felipe, at age seven, knows that if a clay ball is rolled into a sausage, it still contains the same amount of clay, conservation of, my gosh, substance. This page is wrinkled here, it's crazy. At age nine, he knows that the ball and the sausage weigh about the same. Not and until early adolescence will he understand that they displace the same amount of liquid if dropped into a glass of water. And, you know, that's usually something you learn in, um, well, sometimes in elementary science, uh, but usually maybe middle school science. So, <clears throat> Perhaps because they lack the appropriate vocabulary or do not realize what information the other person needs. Judgments about cause and effect also improve during middle childhood. When uh, 5 to 12 year olds ask to predict how levers and balances scales would perform with varying numbers and weights of objects placed at varying distances from the center, the older child gave more correct answers than the younger children. Categorization. The ability to categorize helps children think logically. Categorization now includes such sophisticated abilities as seriation, transitive inference, and class inclusion. Children show that they understand seriation when they can arrange objects in a series according to one or more dimensions, such as weight, lightest to heaviest, or color, lightest to darkest. By seven or eight, children can grasp the relationships among a group of sticks on site and arrange them in order of size. Transitive inference is the ability to recognize a relationship between two objects by knowing the relationship between each of them and a third object. Catherine is shown three sticks, a yellow one, a green one, and a blue one. She is shown 
that the yellow stick is longer than the green one and the green one is longer than the blue. Without physically comparing the yellow and the blue sticks, she knows that the yellow one is longer than the blue one. So we can see there's getting to be some inference working in there. Class inclusion is the ability to see the relationship between a whole and its parts. If pre-operational children are shown a bunch of 10 flowers, seven roses, and three carnations, and are asked whether there are more roses or more flowers, they, uh, excuse me, are likely to say there are more roses because they are comparing the roses with the carnations rather than with the whole bunch. And there's some adults who would fall for that too. <laughs> you know, they have tests like that. You know, are there more roses or more flowers? Well, more roses. No, they're all flowers, silly. <laughs> Not until the stage of concrete operations do children come to realize that roses are a subclass of flowers and that, therefore, there cannot be more roses than flowers. <coughs> Inductive and deductive reasoning. According to Piaget, children in the stage of concrete operations use inductive reasoning. Starting with the observation about particular members of a class of people, animals, objects, or events, they then draw general conclusions about the class as a whole. And unfortunately, some people never outgrow that. They're labelers, um, and they label um, this, that, or the other thing, and according to them, that's just the way it is. Um, and that's not true. <laughs> Nothing is usually cut that dry or black, black and white, you know, it just doesn't. My dog barks. So does Terry's dog and Melissa's dog. So it looks like maybe all dogs bark. And of course we know oh, that's not true. There's like a Basenji or something. It doesn't bark. Um, you know, but that's a general way of thinking. Inductive conclusions must be tentative because it's always possible to come across new information. A dog that does not bark, that does not support the conclusion. Um, and this is where, you know, like I say, there's, there's adults who kind of get stuck in that way of thinking, you know. Um, so it's not great. Um, deductive reasoning. When PJ believed does not develop, um, until adolescence, starts with a general statement or premise about a class and applies it to particular members of the class. If the premise is true of the whole class and the reasoning a sound, then the conclusion must be true. All dogs bark. Spot is a dog. Spot barks. Researchers gave 16 inductive and deductive problems to 16 kindergartners, 17 second graders, 16 fourth graders, and 17 sixth graders. The problems were designed so as not to call upon the knowledge of the real world. For example, one deductive problem was all pogops wear blue boots. Tambor is a pogop. Does tambor wear blue boots? Corresponding inductive problem was, Tambor is a pogop. Tambor wears blue boots. Do all pogops wear blue boots? Contrary to Pia Jayton theory, second graders, but not kindergartners, were able to correctly answer both kinds of problems, to see the difference between them, and to explain their responses. <coughs> and they, appropriately, expressed more confidence in their deductive answers than in their inductive ones. Conservation. In solving various types of conservation problems, children in the a stage of concrete operations can work out the answers in their heads. They do not have to measure away the objects. If one of two identical clay balls is rolled or kneaded into a different shape, say a long, thin sausage, Felipe, who is the at the stage of concrete operations, will say that the ball and the sausage still contain the same amount of clay. Stacy, who is in the pre-operational stage, is deceived <coughs> by appearances. She says the long, thin roll contains more clay because it looks longer. Felipe, unlike Stacy, understands the principle of identity. He knows the clay is still the same clay, even though it has a different shape. He also understands the principle of reversibility. 
He knows he can change the sausage back into a ball. And he can decenter. <coughs> he can focus on both length and width. He recognizes that although the ball is shorter than the sausage, it is also thicker. Stacy centers on one dimension, length, while excluding the other, thickness. Typically, children can solve problems involving conservation of substance, like this one, by about seven or eight. However, in such tasks, <coughs> excuse me, involving conservation of weight, in which they are asked, for example, whether the ball and the sausage weigh the same, children typically do not give correct answers until about age nine or ten. In tasks involving conservation of volume, in which children can uh, judge whether the sausage and the ball displace an equal amount of liquid, when, oh my goodness, get away little bug, hmm. placed in a glass of water, correct answers are rare before age 12. PJ's term for this inconsistency in the beginning of different types of of conservation is horizontal decollage. Children's thinking at this stage is so concrete <coughs> my goodness <clears throat> so closely tied to a particular situation that they cannot readily transfer what they have learned about one type of conservation to another type even though the underlying principles are the same. <clears throat> PJ maintained that mastery of skills such as conservation depends on neurological maturation and adaptation to the environment and is not tied to cultural experience. Support for a neurological basis of conservation of volume comes from scalp measurements of brain activity during a conservation task. Children who had achieved conservation of volume show different brain wave patterns from those who had not yet achieved it, suggesting that they were using different brain regions for the task. <clears throat> so the little brain's got to develop that. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he's stuck together there. Although cross-cultural studies support a progression from the rigid, illogical thinking of younger children to the flexible, logical thinking of older ones, <clears throat> abilities such as conservation also may depend, in part, on familiarity with the materials being manipulated. Mexican children who make pottery understand that a clay ball that has been rolled into a coil <coughs> still has the same amount of clay sooner than, it under, than they understand other types of con conservation. And these children show signs of conservation of substance earlier than children who do not make pottery. Because, you know, you learn what you live. You know more about what you're familiar with than not. Thus, understanding of conservation might come not only from new patterns of mental organization, but also from culturally defined personal experience within the physical world. Because <coughs> like I say, you learn which live. <clears throat> Moral reasoning. Some people never develop this. So that's a shame. To draw out children's moral thinking, P.J. would tell them a story about two little boys. One day, Augustus noticed that his father's ink pot was empty and decided to help his father by filling it. While he was opening the bottle, he spilled a lot of ink on the tablecloth. The other boy, Julian, played with his father's ink pot, even though he knew he shouldn't, and spilled a little ink on the cloth. Then P.J. would ask, <coughs> <coughs> Which boy was naughtier and why? Children younger than seven usually considered Augustus naughtier, since he made the bigger mess. Older children recognized that Augustus meant well and made the larger stain by accident. <coughs> Whereas Julian made a small stain while doing something 
you should not have been doing. Immature moral judgments, Piaget concluded, center only on the degree of offense. More mature judgment considers intent. Um, so that's why I say intent <coughs> is the number one thing um, that you need to look for. Um, we're not supposed to be judging each other, but we do. Let's face it, we're humans. Um, and you need to think about intent when you're thinking about people. Um, and I'm going to leave you there for today. And I hope um, what you've learned today may help you figure out a little bit more about why you do what you do. Until next time.